And then uh, what's going to happen after that is that we're going to allow for Elijah, who I'm going to introduce as well, who's the moderator for this session, to take on take over the session and also uh, take over the session with Precious. Um, yeah, so just, just a brief background. We um, host a couple of uh, webinars and um, session or engaging engagements. Um, and we've been doing this for some time now. And really the focus is really trying to see how best we can help businesses to grow and uh, look at other further opportunities as well. So a platform like this one kind of like presents that opportunity for, for, for businesses in Zambia uh, to learn and to know um, um, all the business things that they need to get, especially when you're, depending on where you are, if you're looking for investment, if you're looking for growth in the business, like where do you find that resource? So hopefully that maybe this can be a channel that can actually lead there. Uh, so Bongo, have we described ourselves as, um, we, 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 we work with great minds, uh, building viable solutions that change the world. And we do this through, um, through a range of startup events like this one. And we also have different types of problems that we have um, that are similar to what we say, like why Combinator, because it's an accelerator program. Uh, so those are kind of like things that you'll get to find. So we help businesses in different stages. So uh, early stage uh, to growth stage to actually um, business that are also considered investment. So we also have and hosts um, certain those kinds of programs under under Bongo have under entrepreneurship department. Um, so really, the focus is really trying to make Zambian Zambians become Zambia become the next um, the next African the next African hub of, of innovation. And hopefully, that maybe we can get there with the uh, with the sort of interaction that we're already building with you and sort of like relationship that we're building with you, trying to see how best we can make Zambia that kind of spotlight. So it's a privilege that we have this conversation happening because it kind of like helps to help us to get there. Um, so we have Elijah who I would say that he's been in the community of Bongo, uh, with Bongo have for, for quite some time now. And um, uh, really, I think what we know Elijah, what I know Elijah as is that he's uh, one of the pioneers or one of the guys who <laughs> introduced me to skateboarding. I don't skateboard, but just uh, three events that I've attended. Um, so like one of the pioneers in Zambia, I think he's really, really trying to bring out that brand and also trying to grow that community in skateboarding. Uh, also working on a different startup. I think you mentioned that to say uh, with you, but also just his business ethics as well and how he's been in the, in the industry, in the Zambian industry or ecosystem has really uh, to the stage which has grown. So it's kind of like has that in-depth knowledge as well on how to uh, set up businesses and how to work with businesses. So it's very, very, very valuable to the community as well. Uh, Elijah, you introduced yourself and then we also have Precious as well who's coming in from uh, Unit 40, Unit 54. Um, also trying to bring out that experience of um, looking at the conversation today and he's been very, very resourceful to come in to, uh, to help us or maybe to give us more information and also looking at the fact that um, um, uh, the Y Combinator is just one of the I would say that one of the best accelerators in, in the world, um, but also like just the story of how that um, has happened. Um, so he'll also give us that kind of like perspective on how that um, happened for him. I've uh, kind of like experienced that one also trying to see how best we can get more Zambian businesses or maybe more African businesses get into Y Combinator. Uh, I'll hand over to Elijah uh, to take over the session. So if you're on Facebook, uh, if you're on Twitter, if you're on LinkedIn, uh, please, um, this is a, this, the format of this conversation is that it's very interactive because it's a, ask me anything. It's the first time that we're piloting this, but really, it's really trying to bring the conversation to the people. Uh, you asking questions, uh, you finding about like you can really, really just feel free to ask him anything. He's quite open to say that um, he's not he's not very fixed on any topic, or maybe he's just going to open it up to any topic. So please, if you have any kind of questions that you need to ask us, yes, please go ahead. Uh, they're very open to answering any kind of questions that you will have. So yeah, I will hand over to Elijah and um, please get in touch with uh, us if you have any questions. I have Roda in the channel who's also um, who's also um, 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 helping out with the with the with the with the tech side. So please ask questions and then we will be able to hand over. So Elijah, you can go ahead and uh, we can start off the kick off the session. Thanks, George. That was a great introduction. And thank you to Bongo High for having us all here today. <clears throat> like George said, I actually came up in the entertainment industry. I'm a big skateboarder, big fan of urban culture. And in 2011, I asked, why isn't there something like X Games or Street League or one of these big types of uh, action sports festivals in Zambia? And everybody told me, it's not possible. You can never do it. 
And then I met a guy named Mike Murray from Bongo Hive who told me, you know, that if you actually understand what you're trying to sell, you can actually turn it into a business and and just turn your idea into a reality. And, you know, I went from a little cipher in arcades parking lot to building a festival that had over 2000 kids. It was the first uh, alcohol free youth festival in Zambia. And I built this through the Bongo Hive launch uh, accelerator program. And, you know, going from a little circle of me and my friends dancing in a parking lot to, you know, booking out one of the biggest uh, arenas in Zambia from 2011 to 2018, I was just like, yo, I got to stay in this Bongo Hive community and learn more because I don't have a business background. I don't have a family with any like business people. So I was just like, you know, the accelerated programs really do add value to like a young person trying to take an idea somewhere. But more than the program and the content itself, it's about community, you know, uh, just learning how to build a business next to Mafashio, Spotless, Zippos, Emusika, so many of the great, you know, Lusaka startups that we have is what taught me as much as being in the programs, because, you know, having somebody who's, you know, shared struggle, having somebody who's in the same position as you uh, learning with them is extremely valuable. So I just, uh, I'm really grateful for this opportunity. And that's why I always volunteer anytime Bongo Hive presents an opportunity to build community, because I know the, the more we build each other as a community of entrepreneurs, the more we're encouraging other Zambians to become entrepreneurs because they're seeing it's possible. And you know, my goal personally is to have entrepreneurs in Zambia be hyper competitive. So, you know, we can like, you know, put ourselves to the highest standard. Anyway, so that's enough about me and why I'm here. Uh, the real reason we're here is, you know, to celebrate some great African entrepreneurship. Uh, you know, Y Com I first heard about Y Combinator from Air when Airbnb got into it. And then I saw so many of the biggest uh, companies today have been through Y Combinator. And when I heard a Zambian guy, a Zambian company was got into Y Combinator, I was like, wow, that's amazing. There's a lot we can learn here. I think it's also put a lot of positive attention towards Zambia. I think this is just like the opening of the floodgates. And I think like, you know, right here, we can hear from the, from the horse's mouth, so to say, like, you know, what were the steps? What was the challenge? Uh, and, you know, what, what, what did uh, Union 54 and Zazu do to get there? And, you know, uh, I'm just uh, uh, you know, we're gonna open up the questions here, maybe to just kind of, give us his background, tell us the story of how a guy from Zambia, uh, you know, just worked his way through, um, you know, high school's professional life and just got to, to, this, to this company. And then we can get into some, some questions. Thank you so much for hyping me up. I feel pumped. <laughs> uh, yeah, so Percy is here. One of the founders uh, of what you know as Zazu, which is now becoming Union 54. Um, so as Zazu, we had one idea, which was, uh, and one frustration, which is a lot of people are spending a lot of money to interact with banks. And we thought we could do it better uh, than the banks in Zambia, even the banks in Africa. So we started off Zazu in 2015 uh, and we pivoted several times uh, up until we became Union 54. And I was actually looking at uh, our previous Y Combinator applications and we applied six times. And in those six times, our idea changed three times. The first time uh, we applied, we'll get into that later on if there are any specific questions about it. But yeah, uh, George said it's an ask me anything uh, and I want to be as helpful as possible. If I start talking about what's interesting to me, then you're not going to learn as much. So please just ask. Uh, there's no right or wrong questions. It's just whatever's going to be most useful to you. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Before we even get into, I, I, I do want to open it up to questions to the mm -hmm. audience. But I just wanted you to maybe just tell us mm -hmm. your background. Mm -hmm. I, I, don't, I don't know if everybody in here knows you. So like, what's your story? What's your partner's story? Yeah, he's talking and about stuff Zazu first emerge. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So I was actually born in Zimbabwe and uh, I left Zimbabwe when I was 14. Uh, and we went to the UK where I lived up until I was 25. 
And when I was there, I studied law and psychology because I thought I wanted to work uh, in criminology, something, you know, profiling serial killers uh, or what have you. <laughs> but that never materialized. So I met my wife and she says, you know, you could work in international development because uh, you're quite good at that sort of stuff, soft skills, legal background. And I didn't know what uh, international development yeah. was, but the first opportunity that I got to practice that was when I went uh, to Zimbabwe to work with some smallholder farmers. And one of the things that we realized when we got there is that there was an outbreak of typhoid but people were still spending maybe like two days to come to the hospital because it was extremely rural. And luckily I had bought uh, a Raspberry Pi when I was going back and I was kind of like learning how to code on this thing. So with the Raspberry Pi, we just quickly fitted it. We connected to an, uh, a SIM card and we were sending SMS messages to people to say, hey, stay home. There's an outbreak of typhoid and cholera. This is how you protect yourself from it. Uh, and quickly people started to pay us money for, for using that SMS service. So the hospital was like, you know what? All of these women, they come to the hospital two weeks or two months before they're due. So we want to tell them uh, when to come to the hospital, can we pay you to use that service? So that was the first time that somebody paid me to use something that we had developed. And that was like one of the best feelings ever. You can't ever get it back. You keep chasing it, uh, but you can't get it back. And uh, through one way or the other, we pivoted. We realized that sending messages to people, uh, a lot of people can do uh, at scale, and you can't really do uh, competitively, make a lot of money in that. So let's help people understand how to farm better. So we pivoted uh, and then started to teach people about uh, insurance, started to teach people about whether index insurance again, how to save money, how to think about loans. Uh, and I think we ended up teaching over 2 million people uh, in Zambia. Uh, we started to analyze that data and we were just like, wow, there's a lot of things that we can do. But what people are just struggling with is to understand when they're speaking with a bank person, when they're speaking with somebody from insurance, what are they really buying and how do they do that? So our thinking at the time was we can develop a mobile wallet connected to a debit card. And then through that way, you can then start selling insurance in the app. You can then start to sell other services in the app, but because you are the one responsible for negotiating the insurance or the value added services, you know that the stuff you're gonna put in the app, that's a lot of the stuff that people are gonna find useful. Uh, what we didn't account for was how long it would take us to get licensed how long it would take to develop the software, how long it would take us to understand what we were thinking about and to implement that. And one way or the other, we realized that uh, you can't really make a lot of money uh, giving mobile wallet services or prepaid cards uh, to, to young people who are not really using it apart from using it granddaddies. So we pivoted again, we adjusted our strategy and we became Union 54. So we then we can then start to sell the stuff that we're really good at. So we go find a bank and we say, hey, your cards don't always work. Or we go to an insurance company, your card, you don't have any debit cards, but you can use our API to issue your own cards. So what Union 54 is, we allow anyone to issue uh, a debit card without needing to go to a bank uh, or to the technical processes or even to speak to MasterCard. So that's something that a lot of companies in Africa across the world are looking for. And that's something that we can monetize and we can just run a sustainable business. So I would say a summary of my curiosity uh, is just really using tech uh, to just achieve really cool stuff. That is amazing and that's a that's a really great story i know we're gonna have a lot of diverse questions you know the focus of the conversation of today is just about getting to know a little bit more about y combinator so if you have I, I see in the chat there's some questions that are not about that and we should mm -hmm. get to those um but I, I i just wanted to get to perseus on y combinator we can discuss that for a little bit mm -hmm. um so perseus Maybe you can tell us like when you had this vision and it was obviously a big vision when you're looking at 
number of unbanked people, people who don't have access to financial services mm. uh, and insurance companies. That that that's a big vision. Why why combinator of all things? Did you apply for other things um, that you were looking to get into? And why were you looking at these um, international accelerator programs? What else were you targeting? Um, maybe tell us more about like what led you to Y Combinator and what other opportunities you are pursuing and mm -hmm. why you thought that was the way to go rather than bootstrapping or looking for local African investors or, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So at the time that we started Zazu, we were one of the first companies in Africa to say we're going to create a digital bank. Even in Nigeria, there were maybe like guys at Carbon who were doing that. The mistake that I made was that we chose to start Zazu in Zambia because at the time, Zambia was like relatively unknown. You would say to people, I'm in Zambia, they would be like, eh, what? And then you hear them Googling to say Zambia. They say, oh, 17 million people. Oh, okay, cute. And you'll never hear from them again because they're like deciding whether to give you a million dollars or not. And they look at 17 million dollars people they look at the gdp they look at the mining industry and they're like you know what this is a donation it's not an investment right so we really struggled we really really struggled to get a sazu off the ground and we only managed to do so because number one we didn't have children at the time so we're kind of like young and stupid and just kind of like persevered if I had to do that again, I'll probably quit after like six months in hindsight. And we only survived because we kept uh, figuring out how to make money, right? So we were like, okay, we're not gonna raise money to develop this digital bank, but there's still money locally. What are the problems that people are facing? So we almost had like a consulting shop in-house where we would go to NGOs and they would say, one of the biggest problems we have is that we're trying to teach people who are further away from the line of rail, as they say in Zambia. And we want to teach people about financial literacy, but we don't want to pay a lot of money in fuel. So we're like, oh, okay, cool. If we develop something like that, would you pay for it? They're like, yeah, we would. How much would you pay? Well, it wouldn't be us paying, it would be a grant. So we applied for a grant and then we got money. And we kept doing that up until we came to a point where kind of like making a lot of uh, money to just sustain the business and to just get to a point where you're not running out of money, which is the most important thing. As long as you're alive, you can always like fight another day. So the reason that we were attracted to Y Combinator is that in the time that we started Zazu, we'd seen other companies, so Flutterwave, uh, Paystack, had gone through Y Combinator and they'd been able to raise money. So we're like, the only thing that these guys have done is go through Y Combinator. We didn't really understand that number one, these guys were a lot smarter than we were. And these guys had actually been trained and had benefited from the network effects of YC. So when we kept reading into the program, you're like, oh shit. Airbnb went through the program, Reddit went through the program, Stripe went through the program. Like, what are they all landing on this? It's like, oh, maybe we should have done an MBA, right? That's what everyone is doing. So if you don't want to do an MBA, which you shouldn't, you go to Y Combinator. When you go on Y Combinator, you've got like three months where every week you're jumping on a call with 400 other companies. And you've got to speak about what you did last week. And you say, hey, Perseus here from Union 54. Union 54 is this and this and that. Last week, we did X, Y, C. It sounds easy right now. You're thinking, anyone can do that. But try and do it in week one. And you say, last week, we moved this widget from this bottom corner to that bottom corner. And then say the same thing again in week two. And then say the same thing again in week three when you're hearing your other kind of like friendly competitors telling you, last week we signed a contract for a million dollars. Last week we had 6 million people look at our website. Last week we did this and that. That pressure where they put you under, when you've got to embarrass yourself or you've got to impress other people, that's something I miss right now. 
because YC has stopped and you know, you're kind of getting relaxed. But throughout that whole three month program, you're being drilled about what your product is, what your numbers are, how you're gonna make money. And you're just networking with everybody. You say, hey, what are you working on? I'm working on this API. Oh, I would love to use that. You get a customer. That's something YC does really well. And you've got all of these problems where if you're running a company, you are expected to become like a lawyer. You understand shareholder agreement. You understand how to read financial statements. You understand how to be the best in your field at marketing. You understand product. You understand HR, you know, one-on-one. -on -one. And you've got to do all of these things, which if you don't have anyone to speak with, you kind of like suffer a lot. So having Y Combinator going through that three-month program and learn all of these small pieces, chunk by chunk, that's something that you can't buy. Um, so if you're thinking about doing YC, I'm going to tell you straight off the bat, apply for it, even if it takes you 20 times. Like you'll be the better for it. Amazing. So I'm gonna I'm gonna open it up to I'm gonna open it up to uh, the group. Um, for those of you that are unfamiliar with uh, with Zoom, please raise your hands so we can try and do this in a little bit of an orderly fashion and not talk over each other. I can see my good friend Mukuzo, who did not waste any time to raise his hand. Um, Mukuzo's actually got a great company and it's a great, uh, it's a great concept in the fintech space. I won't even call it a concept. It's a great solution that I'm, I'm yet to see more of. Maybe you can uh, introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about your company uh, briefly and then ask, ask your question. Hi, Elijah. Hi, Perseus. Thanks again for the, um, the nod there. Um, Perseus, very, very grateful for you, obviously, to be doing this for us. Um, yeah, so my name is Mkuzo Kuwani. Um, I'm from Comgro, and what we are trying to do is democratize access to finance. So, you know, similar to the kind of trend that Persis has been going on, and um, you know, been following him quite avidly from from day one, and rightly so because he's done some some superb uh, achievements, which I'm sure we'd all like to follow. Um, but yeah, we're basically trying to do that by using village banking or community savings and lending groups as a vehicle to integrate people into the formal financial ecosystem. Um, but yeah, that's what we do. And just so I don't take too much time, I just had a quick question for you, uh, Persis, because I was quite interested there when you were speaking about how um, at Zazu, you, you know, you approached quite a lot of NGOs or received a lot of grants rather. Um, how does it work in terms of um, funding? What funding uh, round should you be at or should you look to be at when trying to apply to Y Combinator? Um, because I have, and I, I hope this is a myth, heard that it's a it's a seed accelerator but just looking at the ticket size I, I presume that's what it is um and what does it actually work like sorry so there's two questions what funding round should you look to be at when you apply to y combinator and secondly um how does future funding rounds how do future funding rounds work from there yeah um great job with Comgro. i love it so um, we made like maybe several mistakes throughout the lifetime of sales right and one of those was not being compelling enough to get accepted to YC. Uh, if we had been accepted to Y Combinator, we would have saved ourselves a lot of heartache, a lot of like heartbreak. We wouldn't have given money uh, to extremely like, you know, investors who couldn't have helped uh, as much. So if you can apply to Y Combinator, like as soon as you can, because what you're really saying to, to YC is that I've got this idea, I know how to make money from it, and I want you guys to come in and invest as early as possible. So there are a seed uh, accelerator, but there are companies who go on there who are having millions of dollars in revenue, companies who've got thousands of employees and are going through, and you get companies who maybe just an idea in somebody's head. As long as you think that you can make that three month commitment, lifelong commitment to participating on YC, then you should apply as soon as possible. It doesn't matter at what stage. And the, the really cool thing is that once you get on YC and then you can speak about your business confidently, you can get grilled about it. It becomes a lot easier to speak to other investors. So it's, it's easy for me to say, because when I was raising money for Zazu, I would speak to people. I was like, you know what? This guy didn't give me money. 
you know, I think they're, I think they're, I think they're racist. Uh, I think they're idiots, you know, instead of saying, oh, you know what? I did a terrible job of explaining the product. I did a terrible job of explaining the vision. And you can only say that once you've been through like that hard grueling process. So if you can afford to apply to IC, uh, it doesn't cost you anything, right? You don't need to know anyone to get, you just apply. Uh, just put your best foot forward. Like, yeah, I'm happy to help. Just ping me. Yeah. Lombe, you got a question? Yeah. Hey, um, I just wanted to say, first of all, thanks, Perseus, um, for hey, buddy. Uh, yeah. hosting uh, this uh, space today or this uh, Zoom call today. And I think all of the information is going to be uh, obviously very important to a lot of us. Um, who are hoping to kind of uh, one day put a startup through this uh, the process that you've um, started? Um, so I, I, I'm uh, from with Financial Insight. I, um, we just kind of write about startups and um, different businesses within the country. And one of my main questions for you, which is also a point of advice, because obviously I, I know a bit about um, how like uh, you've gone from uh, funding rounds that were crowdsourced to um, obviously, as Mkuzu mentioned, the NGO space, um, all the way to a, an institutional investor. Tiger Call it the cockroach. Just don't <laughs> die, man. <Just> don't die. <laughs> <laughs> nah, it's a great, the best approach, man, because it's like every single <laughs> element, you've still found your own success, but you've, mm -hmm. you've found each different uh, funding method. So, I mean, uh, to kind of ask, get around to my question, uh, my first question is, what is the main difference between all of the different kind of uh, funding routes that you've applied for? So what's mm. the main difference in terms of when you were making your application for Y Combinator? Was mm. it that you had to be that much more wow? Was it that you had to be that much more diligent? Or was it more like the idea had to be that much more well put together? And my second kind of like question, which is to do with that, is that out of all of the funding that you've done in the different ones, which one was your favorite? Like, which one was the best one? Which one was the most fulfilling? But I can imagine which one the answer is there for that, for that one. Anyway, thanks. Uh, so the first question, what was it again? Uh, go on. So it was, what was it that was different um, in your application for Y Combinator? Was like, did you feel like you had to be a level above? Or did you feel as if there was another thing that had to shine? Like, what was different about your application mm. for Y Combinator than every other mm. um, thing? So this is about yeah. specifically the application process. So even if you don't intend to go on Y Combinator, just do this. Get a mossy, get a bottle of wine, whatever you do, right? Fill in the Y Combinator application. Even if you're like the most successful management team ever, it asks you, what do you do? in like 50 words or less. And you've got to be precise. You can't waffle. You can't say, in the beginning, there was this and that, and this and that, and this and that. Like, what do you do? 50 words or less. How far along are you? Like 150 words. It's like, yo, we're making money here. We're making X amount of dollars a month, this and that. What is your product? What does it do? Like, oh. The problem with Africa is all of this, this, this. Just like get straight to the point. Print that application. And then the next morning, you're like, wow, this is bad. <laughs> and then you do that again, like for as many days as possible. You keep doing that every season, right? And it just makes you that much better understanding what are your weaknesses as a founding team? What do you not understand about a business? Because founders, like we can sit here and we can lie to each other. It's like, yo, how is business, bro? It's like, oh, man, it's going well, right? Yeah? Like we're killing it, we're killing it. But it's not, if you can't explain it in a simple paragraph, you don't understand it. So the process of applying to YC, even if you don't submit the application itself, just do it, it helps you understand. It helps you think about your strengths, what you're really good at. Uh, I hope that makes sense. And I think, from what was the most fulfilling round that we did. Uh, the first time that we ever got money, it was this accelerator where they gave you $30,000 like six years ago. I got that, I called my brother. I was like, yo, 
I took that screenshot. It's on my laptop somewhere. It's like 30,000. I was like, yeah. <laughs> but even all, all of the funding processes, they're unique because you're graduating through the stages and you're kind of like demonstrating that you understand what the payout is going to be, what the journey to get to the next stage is. So they're unique in their own way. But I think the first one, those people who initially believe in you. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. We're looking forward to our first one. But anyway, thank you so much for your answer. Yeah. Really appreciate yeah. it. Uh, Akra, go ahead. Oh, you're on mute. You're on mute. You're still on mute. Oh, we got some questions coming in the chat as well. We should also make some time to... Perseus, you're also on mute. Okay, there we go, finally. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so I have two questions. Uh, the first one is uh, how you get, uh, you, 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 you get people to join you, to, to buy into your, your vision. Because uh, I, I have something that I, I've started currently and I'm like alone and uh, I'm really struggling to, to get to convince somebody to say, okay, this is this, then how for people to, to jump on board. Then the, the, the second question is um, about the accelerator programs. I am currently in one, but uh, I'm having struggles on how much to reveal. I feel like, oh, if, uh, you know, if I review too much, maybe somebody will just run off with this and uh, I remain stranded and see it on TV some other time or something like that. So those are my questions. Perseus, you're on mute. I was asking, do you get offended easily? <laughs> Accra, do you get offended? It's okay. Uh, this accelerator that you're participating on, are you giving them equity? Yes, 2%. Okay. Yeah. If your company ends up being worth $20 million, how much is 2% of 20 here? $2 million. Yeah. You are taking $2 million and you're giving it to these people and you're too afraid to tell them why your business is working or not working. That's the easiest money they're ever gonna make. Like you should be calling them 24 seven. Like that's like paying for a doctor and not showing him like what, what's wrong, right? Going to the dentist, paying, but then saying, you know what? I'm just gonna sit here in the corner and not do anything, but tell my wife that I came. Like you're giving them like 2% of your company. That's the most important thing that you have, not your car, not your house, because that's going to be worth a lot more in the next six months, let alone like 10 years. Like they should know everything that's going on. They've got to really help you. If they're not working as hard for that 2%, they don't deserve it. Get it back. But they can't really help you if, if you're not being honest. Or maybe if you've got specific reasons why you are a bit against sharing uh, we can chat offline. Uh, but if you really trust them, then yeah, they should know everything. That's why you applied. That's why they've got 2%. Mm -hmm. What was the first question? Yeah, the other, the other one is uh, how to, to get some, uh, some people on board, like local people to, you know, to, to make, to be part of Recruiting. your team. Mm. Yes. Um, do you think your idea is good? Uh, it's excellent. Mm, okay. <laughs> is it going to be a big company? Uh, so far, so good. Uh, it's still 2020. So far, so good. Yeah. They've got no excuse. Like, you're telling people, like, yo, I'm working on this idea. I started in 2020. It was just me. It wasn't worth anything. I'm looking for a finance person to help me do X, Y, Z. You're going to get paid. If you don't get paid, you're going to get equity. This equity is going to be worth a lot more. If you believe it, they will believe it. 
But if you hesitate, it's like I, I saw your baby there. If you say to your oh. wife, do you, if you say to your wife, do you <laughs> love me? She's like, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, you're not really convinced. But recruiting, I think people want to see the vision. They want to see that they can leave their government job, they can stop studying, and they can go into the voyage with you, and they won't be called a loser on the other end. Life doesn't go as planned, but if you think that it's going to be a big business, you've got really all the leverage. Like unemployment is huge. Startups are popping. There's a lot of foreign money looking for smart teams in, in Africa. Yeah. If you think you can be one of those, then you've got all of the leverage. You're king. Wow. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Mm. Percy, we actually have a few questions in the chat that are really on this subject matter. So before I get to... Mm. Uh, the rest of the questions in the group, a couple of people are asking when it comes to rec recruiting and talent, uh, like how, how did you yourself uh, like source your initial team members, uh, being part of a tech company, what, like how did you get, like how did you get the people that were able to like program? Oh, somebody's uh, mic is on, we're getting some feedback. Mozalema. So how did you how did you source your initial team mm -hmm. and how did you source your initial software developers, given that, you know, we all know the challenge and the cost associated with developers. Uh, and were you were you were you taking on your first people as equity partners or contractors? Mm. Yeah. Uh, so the first person I recruited was my girlfriend at the time. Now my <laughs> wife. It's like you've got to build up that confidence. Right. <laughs> To go to a stranger and say, I'm going to hire you, uh, it's just like firing. It never gets easy. But again, the context of having the confidence helps you to be able to do it better. Uh, so, And then after that, I think the first person we hired uh, was also a friend of mine from university. Yeah. I was like, you know what? I'm going to do this company. It's going to help people. But you know, I don't want to do sales because I'm too shy. And I, I was like, who is the most confident person I know? I was like, yo, I'm working on this. I think you'd be perfect for it. Can you join me as sales? And I'll give you equity in it. And then he's like, no, I'm not going to do that. And then after like a six weeks or so, he's like, yeah, I'm in, let's do it. And the first meeting we went to, I was like, all right, you're the sales guy. So. <laughs> Was that a mixture of equity and salary? Because I think a lot of people are asking questions around that. How do I get those founding members? Was it a mix of equity and salary? And how did you make sure that you just, and like how much equity did you decide to give those first employees? Maybe you can educate us on that process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in the first, uh, the first team we had was myself, Alessandra and Sham, uh, my friend. And we yeah. were living in one house and yeah. we calculated that we needed uh, money to pay rent. So I was responsible for paying the rent. Uh, and then everything else was kind of like hacking and just kind of like asking parents who deliver food once in a while so that we don't die. And those <laughs> first two were primarily paid in equity. That's why they joined. So how, did you, how did you decide how much equity to give them, knowing that Sham may mm -hmm. not be there forever? How did you decide on the amount of equity? I thought Sham was going to be there forever. Like, you don't hire people who think they're going to be for six months. That's like, that's worse, right? Because then you're starting and stopping. You only hire people who are like, going to help you become the better, best version of you, help you to get to the next stage and then grow into that role. And in terms of how you divide equity, I think Y Combinator asks who are the founders and they only consider a founder if they have 10% or more. And I really think that the best way of thinking about it is imagine that this company does well and you've got a billion dollars in cash. Like how many other people have got as much money as you that you have helped to get there? Are you going to have a billion dollars and then your sham is going to have like $2 million? It's like, who are you going to spend that money with, right? Uh, it's got to it's gotta have balance. So a lot of people say, I'm going to find a founder, a co-founder, and give them 2% equity. It's like, that's not really a founder, right? That's, they're taking all of the risks uh, up front, so they've got to be rewarded meaningfully. 
so I think it's really up to you. I've seen a few blogs uh, on the internet thinking about how to divide our founder our ownership. But if you're doing all of the work, then it's just better just say I'm a solo founder. But if you genuinely think that you're bringing in somebody who's going to be a co-founder, that if the business is going well, you're celebrating together. If it's not going well, you're thinking about it together. They're not just taking direction from you, but they're in it as well. Then you should have as close to uh, 50 50 as possible. Perfect. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm personally very disappointed with the women in this discussion, not asking questions. I would very much love to hear from one of our female entrepreneurs or female members of this discussion to kind of know maybe what your thoughts are around, you know, these opportunities around raising funding and being part of accelerator programs. In the meantime, I saw Chomba had a hand. I don't know if that's a guy or a girl. We have beautiful unisex names in Zambia. But in the meantime, I'll let Theo ask a question. Uh, the hand has been up for a while. Theopolis, mm -hmm. go ahead. Um, thank you, Elijah. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you for switching oh, okay. your camera off, Theo. We appreciate yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was a mistake. <laughs> okay, so my name is Theophilus Kalo. Uh, I'm Zambian, obviously. I'm 17 and I finished high school last year. So uh, firstly, I want to say thank you to Pesius because I heard of Zazu from a friend of mine. He's been using Zazu for the past like three years now. I've been trying to get an account, but obviously I can't yet because like I'm, I'm 17 and stuff and everything. And um, my question is on an idea that I had in the peak of the pandemic because uh, people needed medicines and stuff. So my idea was, well, I might as well just share it. My idea was a startup company, primarily with a mobile application and like USD, yes, USSD codes where a person could order the medicines if they needed medicines in their home since like we're quarantined at the moment, at that moment. So if people needed medicines in their homes, they'd uh, order whatever they needed. If they needed like a personal doctor to go there, we would have a team on site that would like maybe be able to go and treat the person where they were. And they, that was basically what my idea was in a nutshell. Now, I'm not even going to ask how to get in Y Combinator yet, because I, I still don't know so many things that happen in between. So just any advice that you would give to me at my level of getting such a startup off the ground, off paper and into actuation. Yeah. Um, ask your best friend to punch you in the stomach and then try and dial USSD and order medicines, then go through the, the, the journey. <laughs> <laughs> so why Combinator have got this thing? Uh, every time you go on Y Combinator, you always be, they'll ask you, what did you do last week? And you say, oh, I did this and that, I did this and that. And they'll say, why are you changing your product? You say, oh, I think because uh, it looks better in blue. Or I think that, I think that, then I'm like, why do you think, what are your customers telling you? So the best people to tell you whether an idea is good or not are your customers. So as quickly as, as soon as possible, you should find somebody, not just one person, go stand outside of a pharmacy, ask people, hey, instead of coming to this pharmacy, would you have used an app to order your medicines? Yes, why? Because it's faster. How much would you have paid? Like, fuck off, I wouldn't have paid anything or I would have paid $50. Then you understand if it's a business or not. Or they'll say, no, I wouldn't have chosen to use an app because I'm ordering something embarrassing. I want to pick it up myself. But those are the people who are going to give you proper answers to help you decide whether you should do this business or not. So before you apply for Y Combinator or before you raise money or start developing any software, just speak to potential customers. There's a guy from Tanzania, uh, Benjamin from Nala. When he was starting his company, I think he printed like t-shirts and he went in the streets of Da and he spoke to like thousands of people. I think that's one of the best examples of like speak to your customers. They will tell you whether your idea is good or not and they'll tell you how much they'll pay for it. 
that was that was really good advice. And also, Theo, you know, since you're so young and you're just thinking about entrepreneurship, I definitely would encourage you to get in touch with Bongo Hive. They will give you all of these like tools that will allow you to put your idea on paper, think about it, and see if it can actually be viable in the market. I, you know, that's why Bongo Hive exists. Um, I can tell you personally, a lot of my initial assumptions of creating X Games in Zambia didn't exist. They get mm. their sponsorship from the U.S. Navy. We get our sponsorship from the NG from NGOs because that those are just the models that work in Africa. Mm. You can have assumptions, but it's great if you can write them down and test them out. Yeah. So go to Bongo Hive. Um, and well and done, Hair, for being a 17 interested in like startups. 17 year old. That's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. That's what that's what Zambia needs. Mm -hmm. Um, Perseus, I I know we're kind of uh over our time. Mm. Uh, that's fine. Let's let's keep going. Okay, perfect. Uh we're supposed to be running from six to se six till seven. We have a couple of hands up. Uh we've got um uh, Mukuz has got a second question, but I'll open it up to Richard Miraj. And then back to Mukuzo. Mm -hmm. So, Richard, feel free. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Am I audible? Yeah, we, we can hear you. We'd like to see you, though. All right, thank you. <laughs> okay, sure, sure. Hello. So, I hope everyone is doing great. My question is, uh, I, I don't have a startup. So, but I, it's a space I'd like to get into. And then I, when I saw the ad for this webinar, I went and checked out what Y Combinator is about. And I was like, oh, Y Combinator, I've heard about it, but this year I think of it. And I tried to apply for it. And in one of the questions that I, one thing I noticed was uh, they asked if I am a scientist, engineer, or a tech person. So I wanted to find out what are the, Success odds of somebody who is not in these three categories in gaining funding in other programs, not just white Combinator or other accelerator programs. When you are not one who is actually putting in the skills, you might have the idea, but the skills are probably outsourced. What's the success probability of that person, or how best can that person approach that situation in order for them to? increase their probability of getting funding in such an instance. So is it, what's the probability of success if you're not an engineer or software developer? Yes, mm -hmm. but you want to get into that space. You have an idea of tech. So yeah. I, I presume you stand a higher chance if you're the one who's actually doing maybe the coding and maybe just get a little help here and there, but yeah, um, so I think it's different. Why Combinator, their, their preference is to fund people who are software developers because the assumption is if they can give money to Perseus, who is not a developer and therefore needs to hire people but doesn't know how to hire people, is going to spend a lot more money versus uh, like a guy like Elijah, who's a software developer. He will have an idea. He doesn't advertise for a position. He develops the first version of the product and he starts getting customers quite quickly. Therefore, Elijah is a safe bet. But uh, I think there's now been countless examples. I'm not a developer myself. I understand uh, what's going on, but I'm not a developer. I don't write code uh, at all. And we got in. And I think a big part of doing that is being able to show that you've got a team so traditional software companies have got like three men uh, teams or three women teams. They've got a CTO who's writing the code. They've got the CEO who's doing like the business. And then later on, you bring in like a uh, operations officer. So if you can demonstrate that you can hire or you can have a founding team where you complement each other's skills, I think that speaks well to your ability to then develop and recruit into a big company. Uh, and also being able to grow into your potential. So even if you're not a developer, find a developer. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank Perfect. you very much. And I just wanted to say I'm a huge fan of Zazu, number one cash program. Excellent. <laughs> my, uh, what? My what Zazu card. Yeah. Um, yeah, sorry. nice. <laughs> uh, oh, sorry to cut you off. Um, Perseus, I wanted to go to some questions in the chat. 
um, because I don't want to ignore the lovely people texting us in the chat. There's a there's a really good question, and I think this is something all entrepreneurs struggle with. This is something uh, I think you touched on briefly earlier when you talked about sharing an apartment with your three co-founders, your two other co-founders. Mm -hmm. uh, the first question is, how do you decide what to pay yourself as a founder? This is if you're fortunate enough to have money in your startup. And uh, there's somebody in the group who has received some funding and they wanted to know some funding do's and funding don'ts. Mm. And I'll ask the third question after these two. Okay. So how do you pay yourself as a founder and what are some funding do's and funding don'ts when the funding comes in? Mm -hmm. um, in the beginning, I wish I understood this uh, sooner than it took me. Uh, and it's my fault for not getting it soon. When you start off, you've got a company and that company has got like 100 shares. When you raise funding, you take 10 shares and you sell them. And you say, these shares are worth yada, yada, yada. Once you've got the money in the bank, you've got to grow to a certain point before you sell the next 10 or 20 shares. So as a founder, your payment is really holding the large chunk of equity. So if you need $600 to survive in a month, pay yourself $600 because you shouldn't use cash to, use, to survive, right? To, to sell your equity and then lose out on the big payout in the future. So you wanna pay yourself the bare minimum that you can afford to pay rent, have like one or two nights out, uh, have like bills looked after, what have you. And for most people that's different. Uh, a founder with three children maybe needs like $100,000. A founder with like a single founder in the States maybe needs like $20,000. In Zambia, maybe you need like $1,000 a month or $400, whatever it is, you are the best person to judge that. So uh, I hope that's clear. Just pay yourself what you need to survive. And that varies because we don't know what your personal situation is. Maybe you've got like dependents that depend on you. Maybe you've got like ex really expensive bills. Uh, so in the beginning, we just said, all right, what do we need? To survive this month that's what we're paying and it was mainly just rent uh, that's the biggest expense that most founders have and with the second question uh, major do's and don'ts for when you get funding if you're the ceo and everybody knows that you now have money there's a big temptation for people to say we're not going to bring in water uh, from home anymore. We're going to buy water. Like, we're not going to get Orlando anymore. Let's buy a car. We're not going to clean anymore. Let's hire a cleaner. People start coming uh, with a lot of excuses to increase the, the spending that you're doing. So I think the quickest thing that you can just do is actually create budgets and stick to them and say, tech guys are being uh, going to have X amount of money that we've just raised. Ops guys are going to have X amount of money for the next 12 months and stick to it. So that's a major do. Just be really religious. Like you need to guard that money jealously. Uh, you should always know how much you're spending. You should always know what's coming in uh, from revenue. And I think, yeah, those are the two main things. Don't lose track because once you get money, people forget. Money makes people stupid, huh? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So um, let me just reiterate that from the man who has raised millions of dollars in this chat, you need to conserve your resources. I think a lot of people get too excited when they see large funding rounds and they think, oh, that means big dollar salary, nice vehicle. You know, that funding that the investors give if you don't manage it wisely, you can find yourself facing a down round. You can find yourself starting as the majority shareholder and ending up as an employee with a small amount of equity. So I think we, we've we've heard it from the man himself. Be you can get very fired from your own company. That's true. Mm. Be very conservative with your resources because if you don't hit the investors' KPIs or the business doesn't work out, it may no longer be your business. I think that's uh, I think that's the advice we really need to hear because there there is a culture of Africa and money and I don't want to get into that too much. Uh, there, uh, Perseus, there was a question. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was from Mundia. 
I'm sorry, I'm not sure. I, I can't tell whether the name is up or down. The question is, after all the funding processes and rounds you've gone through, how much percentage equity do you currently own? I don't know if that's <laughs> my friend, person. my friend, my friend, what are you? Are you said that? <laughs> <laughs> um, but also, rather less personally, I'd also like to find out, maybe you can just get, you said this a little earlier, what are your thoughts on how much equity do you give for what for what kind of funding, given that the majority of people will not get their money from places like Y Combinator, they may be looking for that first funding from a Zambian investor or mm. some kind of smaller incubator accelerator programs. So the terms may not be as rosy and they really need those first resources to, to mm. get the ball rolling. So I don't know if you wanna answer that first one, mm. but definitely we need to know on how to value our equity especially if we're in a position where we don't have our own financial mm -hmm. resources and we really, really need the money that's being offered to us. Mm -hmm. So I own enough of the business for me to wake up every morning and still go on Twitter and not hang myself. I like <laughs> <laughs> uh, And I think to the second point, you only want to raise money from people whose values you're aligned with. Five years ago, there were people who were investing $20,000 for 51% of a business. I know of maybe a handful of companies who have raised money from people that we all know, people that we think are really nice people, but they're like, they're not. And you as a startup, your job is to be able to actually ask yourself the hard question. And I appreciate that not everyone can like, believe me on face value, but there's nothing like your equity is the most important thing that you'll ever have. Not your house, not your car, not your sneakers, not your Ford, whatever. That's the most expensive thing because you believe that this company is going to be worth something. So you want to be greedy with it as much as possible. When you're raising money, you somebody gives you $20,000 and they want 50% of your company. If you take that money, then you are implicitly telling them that it's okay for them to walk all over you because you don't believe that this company is going to go places. If you can achieve a pretty big outcome on $20,000, then you didn't need $20,000 in the first place. Uh, so I think there's two ways to think about it. Number one, is it enough money to take you to where you want to be if you never raise money in 18 months, 24 months again, are you going to grow a pretty big company? And if you really need the money, then the best thing you can do is to get somebody to make you an offer to say, I'm going to give you $20,000 for 50%. And then you find people in the ecosystem and you say, hey, what do you think about this investor? This is the offer that you've given me. Because an investor speaks to hundreds of people like you on a daily basis, whereas you only speak to one investor like every year, right? So you don't know what's normal. You don't know what's not normal. So if you speak to other founders and say, I've got this offer for this amount of money for this equity from this investor, what do you think? And the chances are everybody who's a founder is going to tell you the truth to say, you know what? This is bullshit. Like, don't sign this because it's going to ruin your life. Or this is actually a pretty good deal. I would sign this if I were you. And once you get like three or five people telling you the same thing, then you can kind of make up your own mind. But speak to people who are in the ecosystem, because everyone knows what's going on. I, I I truly respect that, and I think you even said it somewhat in uh, your founding story how you worked with your girlfriend, you all shared one apartment because mm -hmm. it was about keeping yourself in a position where you're not desperate, given that it's very hard to get a good deal your first time around. And I personally think as an entrepreneur, if you think you need somebody else's money to start your business, consider doing something else. There are a lot of ways to get those that initial funding. Perseus was out there talking to all these NGOs and applying for grants, doing whatever it, it took. I personally asked all of my clients to give me a 50% down payment and just trust me. Which is and smart. Yeah. My clients became my investors. Mm -hmm. You know, and we, we bootstrapped it by building a reputation in that you pay us 50% and we always deliver all the time. Mm -hmm. So I think you, you, you just have to realize that, you know, we are in an environment where 
resources are uh, challenging, but there are many, there are many options, there are many alternatives. You can go and get advice, you can find out what other people did. Uh, mm -hmm. Don't find yourself desperate and get in a bad deal because you know, if if you if you're desperate for money now and you take a bad deal, as the company grows, you'll be bitter and you always hate your shareholders, yeah. which is just not healthy for the growth of the company. Mm -hmm. um, just, just my two cents. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so oh my goodness, we have one of the best DJs uh, in Lusaka. He's also a businessman. His name is Mirage. Uh, Mirage, or what are your what are your questions? What are your thoughts? Please introduce yourself. Uh, if you have spoken, can you just put your hand down so we can see? Oh yes, please. We we still have some hands up from people that have asked questions. Mm -hmm. um, Mirage, Richard, Tendai, um, I see you. We're we're getting to you. Mirage, are you there? You can ask your question. I am. Right. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Am I audible? Great. Um, right. Uh, Elijah, wow. Thank you for that very elaborate introduction there. Um, yeah, Precious, it's nice to meet you. Um, great of you to do this for the startup ecosystem at Zambia, especially leading the flag for the white Combinator um, startups out here. But um, my question was related to your investment. So, um, I'd like to understand what is the difference in the deal you got versus the 500k standard investment now? Okay. So when we went through Y Combinator, you would get $125,000 for an initial 7%. And throughout the later stage funding rounds, Y Combinator would reserve the right to get diluted only up to 4%. Uh, so that implies like a valuation of $1.9 million something. Mm -hmm. But now the valuation is not being set. So it's mm -hmm. called a most favored nation where mm -hmm. Y Combinator would give you 125K still for the 7% mm -hmm. and, and another 350K, 325, 75, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's no valuation set on that. So the incentive is that the next round that you get if you get it at a higher valuation, you get less dilution. Mm. But if you take like money straight after Y Combinator from a guy who's giving you $20,000 at a 2 million valuation, mm -hmm. then Y Combinator are also investing 350K at the same valuation. Mm. So it's forcing founders to be able to actually think bigger aggressively. Is that clear? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's quite a complicated financial mechanism, but it makes sense um, in terms of incentives, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, because uh, there was this arbitrage thing that was happening where a lot of people would take money from YC uh, mm. and then people just say, you know what, I don't care what you're doing. I know you're on YC. I'm just going to give you money. And mm. it's kind of just kind of like gambling. So mm. YC is forcing founders to actually think about who they want to raise from. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. gotcha. So, don't you think convertible debt is much better for a young company when it's really hard to um, put mm -hmm. a valuation on it? It gives them at least the freedom to kind of get some things going before they, they set a price on their equity. Yeah. And then if things don't work out, what happens to that convertible debt? Well... I personally feel like that's the risk of taking on an investor in a venture-backed startup. You know, venture capital is different from all other types of capital. And I kind of think that these are discussions that we need to have. You know, mm -hmm. I, I first got exposed to this when we met some VCs at Bongo Hive and they, they told me to read venture deals. And it's mm -hmm. not somebody giving you money and they get shares. There are structures, there's participating, non-participating, mm -hmm. yeah. there's preferred. I won't, I won't bore you with uh, showing off. No, but it's, it's good education, yeah. right? The first time yeah. that we didn't have money, uh, like four years ago, we had to take a loan with a personal guarantee that I'm going to repay that. Like American VC startups never have to do that. But because you're yeah. operating in an environment where there was no capital, you are kind of forced to do it. So are you saying convert people should not do these convertible debt deals? If, if the business doesn't go well, then the investor, what you're saying to an investor, I've got this company, this is like going to be bigger than Jesus' second coming. <laughs> it's your privilege to invest in this company because 
lo and behold, I'm going to make you a fuck ton of money. If you believe that, why then would you take money from somebody who can then turn out and say, uh, the business failed. I want my money back. You're like, yo, I just lost my business. Where am I going to have this money to pay you back, right? When it converts, because they're not taking any risk. They're guaranteed money either way. If it goes yeah. really well, they get like 200 eggs. If it doesn't go well, they get money back from you. And I don't think you should sign that because you're going to be stranded as a founder. Are you saying all founders should educate themselves on these um, investment financial terms and conditions? You, do you think that's yeah. essential to the process? I think when the time comes, you will learn. But there's no point trying to get ahead of yourself, trying to learn about all of these things if it's never going to apply. If you don't think that you'll ever raise money from a VC, then don't learn VC language. But if you're ambitious and you want to understand what's really going on, first of all, speaking to your customers is the most important thing you can be doing on a daily basis, developing products and then selling, right? Making sure that there's revenue coming in. At the point that there's money coming in, you don't sign anything without understanding anything. Whether it means like having two, three lawyers, you educate yourself. But you can do that quite quickly. Great. Tendai, you have a uh, question? Richard, I've seen you disappeared. You were going to be next. So Richard, uh, if you're- uh, I've actually just got one more part to yeah. that question. Uh, you really, uh, sorry. Uh, Go on, Miraj. Oh, sorry, um, sorry. Yeah. Uh, let me just find that. Um, right, so uh, the next part was how long did the process take up SES, you know, from application to acceptance? And can you talk just in high level some of the necessary programs that you went through? Um, maybe uh, mention one of your favorites um, through that journey. Uh, favorite, what, sorry, I missed that word. The programs, um, you know, was it, was it, you know, seminars that you had to attend ah, okay. or networking groups that mm -hmm. you worked with throughout the progress you know can you talk to yeah us? so i think we applied uh in in july and hang on so the when we got in we applied it was the winter batch and we applied maybe like three months before hmm. uh and then when they shortlisted us we interviewed they scheduled the interview for a month in advance. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we had like two interviews. Mm -hmm. So I would say it took about four months. Uh, mm -hmm. And once we got in, it was obviously uh, a bag of nerves, right? Because you're like, all right, this is fucking happening. Uh, yeah. We need to make the most of it. Yeah. And you meet other companies. And the first thing you're like, Jesus Christ, I hope they don't notice that I'm here. <laughs> uh, which, which is great uh, you always want to feel like that and then my favorite program um, was a company called Brex so mm -hmm. Brex uh, these uh, guys from Brazil who are doing issuing uh, credit cards in the US and Brex is like the story is identical to what Zazu had gone through because for us to issue cards under Zazu we had to work with at least four different banks over four years. We had to sign so many different contracts. Each contract would get canceled. And I studied law as my background. So I had to educate myself on exactly what I was signing up uh, with MasterCard. So I had to read the MasterCard documentation. And I mm. thought I was unique uh, by doing that. But when the Brex guys were speaking, they were like, yeah, we also had to educate ourselves on Brex. The first customer we signed, we didn't have a website. Mm -hmm. They had to email us their contracts. They had to email us their KYC documentation. Nice. And as a result, uh, we kind of like grew from there. Yeah. And when those guys were speaking, in our mind, we were like, we're going to launch our product uh, in end of September, I think. Mm -hmm. When they finished speaking, I was like to everybody, what the fuck are we doing, right? Mm -hmm. Like you don't need a fancy website. You don't need mm -hmm. like a fancy lawyer to, to launch a product. You mm -hmm. just need to do it. Mm -hmm. And as a result, we launched, uh, I think that night. So that was my favorite talk. But you also had like people from Airbnb who were coming to speak and they were talking about running a public company. Mm -hmm. And when there was COVID and the stuff they were going through and how mm -hmm. if they're multi-billionaires now, but they're kind of like YC is still their model where mm -hmm. they hold each other accountable. 
to mm. say, what have we learned this week? How are we doing that? Mm. Uh, and even the guys from Stripe who came and spoke and they show you pictures of what they looked like when they were younger, cycling on bicycles, going Policy from office to yeah. office, right? Yeah. To sign customers. So people would say, I can't sign. I don't have a contract. Mm. There you go. There's a contract. Mm. They sign it. Oh, okay. I'm going to do the integration next week. Oh, where's your computer? I'll do the integration for you. So <clears throat> mm. that kind of like hassle, uh, mm. being able to hear from the host's mouth. Mm. Awesome. Yeah. And one more thing. Uh, thank you for that. This is um, one more Mirage. question. Do you, have, <laughs> do you have any more, do you have any experience with a co-founder matching program on Y Combinator? Uh, no. I, I wish okay. I could see. Like, I hate to sound like one of those old guys. Like, back in my day, there was no software to find co-founders for us. We had to go out in the streets. Sure. It's like, you know, I wish there was something like that when I was the king. Because extremely valuable. You get made with smart people. So if you're if you're thinking about doing it, uh, then you should definitely apply to that That's program. Awesome. Cool. Thanks for those responses. Uh, very helpful. Yeah, no great. worries. Happy to help. Great, Just bring me. Great, great responses. And you know, one thing I really heard is it doesn't matter whether you're just starting or you're a multi-billionaire, community is important, accountability is important. I hope we all heard that. Mm -hmm. Tendai. I know you've been I, waiting. I just, hi, Elijah. <laughs> yeah, I have been. <laughs> um, okay, so my name is Tendai, and I'm the co-founder of Busy Bar, which is essentially a platform that connects busy people to local service providers or taskers that help them run their personal home or professional tasks or errands. And my question is really about the YC, your, your successful YC application. What would you say you did right uh, this time around? And also maybe just to flip the question, what would you say were some of the lessons you learned doing filling out the application the first few times? Um, if, if you're a founder, your natural, like your default status is to over explain things because you think the other people who are listening are dumb, right? But they're much smarter than you. So instead of like talking too much, what I learned by doing the YC application so many times is how to just keep extremely complicated ideas very, very short and just allow people to fill in the silence or the gaps by using like inferred knowledge. So being able to explain something uh, quickly and succinctly, I think that's a skill that whether it's using a YC or writing an email or even like tweets, it's like valuable. But I think more than that, it was being able to show uh, the, the, the progress between applications. So when we first applied, we thought we we're gonna develop Zazu to become Amazon where African farmers would sell potatoes. And then after that, we thought we were gonna like become like an SMS messaging platform, a challenger bank, and then now an API. So being able to say, we started thinking about this idea on X date now we have got Y customers who are paying us Z dollars, right? That shows that there's momentum. And YC actually writes a lot. If you go on the YC website, it tells you how to put together uh, a successful YC application. And I think anybody should, should start doing that quite quickly, uh, just like re regularly rather, where you understand what ex they tell you. On this question, this is what we're looking for. These are some of the mistakes that we see. I don't think there's anything like that in the world where they tell you exactly what you need to do to get in. If you can show that you're going to make a lot of money, you're going to have a big impact, uh, then I think they'll read your application. And they read all of the applications that you send. Even if it's like 40,000, they print all of them. Uh, I don't know if they print actually, but they read all of them. If they don't understand something, they'll message you. Uh, so it's very... You learn quite a lot just by filling in the, the uh, application itself. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. John, you've been waiting for some time. Go ahead. Uh, thank you very, very much. Uh, enjoying the talk so far. Uh, my question is, uh, okay, there's 
of course, uh, there's, there's a lot of opportunity for entrepreneurs, right? But what about for people who would like to, let's say, be part of a, a company, especially Zazu, uh, it being a fintech, you know, yeah. most of us are software engineers or some of us are going to be graduating this year. So we're looking for opportunities in different, you know, uh, fintech. But what, what happens usually is that we don't really know the, the stack or knowledge that one has to acquire, say, for one to, for that person to say to come into, to work for Zazu or especially fintech companies in Zambia. That stack yeah. that one's supposed to know. So I wanted to find out uh, what stack of knowledge does one have to have for them to actually say work for Zazu or any other fintech companies in Zambia and what opportunities are, are there for, for us as software developers. Thank you. If you're a software developer, you're a king, my friend. Eh? <laughs> you make more money than anybody in the world and people are gonna hire you from anywhere, right? Uh, the best way to learn what stack people are looking for is to go on their job descriptions. So right now we're looking for developers, uh, senior backend developer, technical support manager, uh, and it even says exactly who we're looking for. It talks about uh, the stack that we're looking for, like precisely. You can do that for, for Union 54, and if you think you match, let me know, uh, and we can schedule an interview. Uh, but yeah. just look at the job descriptions. John, I can tell you that was actually the best question I've heard all night because I think rather than just mm -hmm. saying, oh, I want to start a tech company and apply to YC, you can get a wealth of knowledge by, you know, working for a company that is in the space that's succeeding. Because when you work for, when you work for a fast growing company, you learn the process, the stages, the challenges. You literally get paid to learn how to build a startup when you work in one. So mm -hmm. I think that's actually a very strong approach. You, you, you can be like some of us and try and fail and figure it out. But mm -hmm. I think that's a, that's, that's a good, that, that's a good approach. Um, yeah. what, so, sorry, sorry. Uh, what oh. about, uh, are there any, sorry, are there any opportunities for internships, uh, even at Zazu? Uh, yeah. If you think you've, you can contribute, then definitely, uh, email me. He said, E email him, go check out the website. They have a list of opportunities. Mm -hmm. People are crying for devs. Devs are devs are like in high demand. In fact, uh, if anybody's looking to join a great financial technology company, see me as well, if you have development talent. Um, Tafadzwa. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks, John. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Elijah, sorry. Uh, hi, Pesos. Uh, Tafadzwa here uh, from Dawa Health. Uh, yeah, so, you know, on my journey also, uh, we are trying to build uh, Dawa House. You know, I've seen um, other angels and other investors asking uh, us to register or incorporate in the U.S. Uh, I joined in late, so maybe you talked about it earlier on or, you know, maybe I missed it or you didn't. So I wanted to ask, uh, ha has Zazu, uh, you know, gone through that process uh, or, you know, you solely uh, registered maybe in the U.K. and Zambia Lawn or you had to, you know, because they're saying investor law in the U.S., uh, a number of investors understand that more uh, compared to other regions of the country. So I just wanted to find out that. Uh, then also maybe just ask around safes. Uh, it's something I've been hearing a lot and reading around, uh, you know, the advantages of that, disadvantages. Um, so, yeah, maybe if you can just give a brief summary around, you know, those two questions. It's quite uh, an, an easy process to have like a US company and a, or a UK company. And you're gonna need to do that uh, as soon as possible anyway, because you're really asking people who've never been to Zambia to invest millions of dollars in a local company uh, when they don't really understand anything about the protections mechanisms uh, or any protections they have. So if you can, uh, you can go on platforms like Flutterwave they now allow you to create a US company uh, quite easily. There's a company called No Rebase, uh, who are also allowed on Twitter for the last few weeks. They allow you to create a US company uh, quite easily. So you can do that. So you should do that anyway, it's good practice. Uh, and with regards to saves, when you raise money, you are saying to an investor, my company is worth X millions of dollars or X thousands of dollars but you don't really understand how to do that if you don't have any revenue. 
or if you're too busy to get engaged uh, in like a fundraising process. So as safe, just say somebody's going to give you money uh, at a pre or a post defined valuation. So they'll say, I give you $20,000 at a post money valuation of 65. That means that you don't have to decide a valuation right now and you can get money uh, and raise and get back to work. So it's just about op optimizing for speed and efficiency when you need money quite quickly. And uh, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, thanks for that. Yeah, no worries. Uh, I've got to run. It is breaking hellfire. I think you can hear my child crying in the background. Oh, no. Oh, no. And you know <laughs> what? We, we are at the end of this. Um, I'm so sorry for anybody who didn't get to ask a question, but uh, I am going to... I am going to close off with just one question, which I hope you can answer quickly. You know, you're probably one of the most successful people in Zambian startup history in terms of raising me, man. Why would you say that? <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm just, I was just looking at the numbers. I, I, I Googled this. You are like on some top 10 lists. So really, the question is like, you know, a lot of us in this group, we have some big ideas and we really want to sell the big vision. I want to I want to know on behalf of everybody, like, what kind of numbers do you put out to your to your investors to show them that the vision is big, the tech is scalable? Are you are you looking at number of people who you can provide services to across the continent? Do you pitch them a Zambian strategy? Like you know, everybody says, "Oh, the Zambian market is too small." That's why these investors don't invest. But clearly, you you've told them something. You you sold them a vision that they say, "This guy, he's the guy. He's got the tech. He's got the team." To make this happen well what is it that you 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 like what kind of numbers do you sell like mm. how big do you pitch it so you you've got to be comfortable with two things be comfortable around beautiful women okay that's like <laughs> a skill that will just pay dividends do that as early on as possible and number two be comfortable with big numbers if you're trying to raise money and you come from a very unprivileged background, the first time I was asking for money, I couldn't say $20,000 because I was like, oh my God, they're going to think I'm an asshole, <laughs> right? But if, like, just get it out of your mind. If you understand that software can be used in Mexico, it can be used in Zambia right now, and you understand that you're good at something and your product helps people to make money or to save money, you know that you can operate your product in many multiple markets. So what you're selling is not Zambia or one country. You're selling an African opportunity, a global opportunity. Why would somebody in Miami give you money to operate uh, a product in Zambia? Like they, they want to invest in Africa, billion people. Uh, Seriously, I've got to run. My wife is going to kill me. <laughs> no, thank you, Precious. Thank you so much. I think this this was great. Um, thank you, everyone, for participating. Thank you, Bongo Hive. This has been amazing. And um, Precious, we wish you all the best. Thank you for um, having me. Let's let let's let's get Zazu to some unicorn numbers. Everybody, download the app. Get the card. In fact, my card is overdue. And uh, we wish you all the best, man. We're all rooting for you. All right, cheers guys, have a good one. Hi, Precious, All thank right. you so much. Okay, Elijah, you can close up the session. I think we're good to go now. Yo, <laughs> first of all, shout out to all the survivors, the 22 people still in here. I can tell you're really hungry for success because you made it all the way to the end. Um, let's let's do, oh, thank you, Maretta. Guys, let's let's do more of these. Let's try and, you know, we don't need uh, a guest who's raised millions of dollars for us to exchange ideas and share experiences. I learn a lot from people who haven't raised any money, who are just getting started, in, who are just recruiting their first developers or building their first product. Let's do more community. I think that's really, that's really the key. Um, uh, George, this was super great. Thanks to Bongo Hive. I don't know if anybody else has anything they want to say or any questions they want to ask. I want to leave it open. Or George, do we have to shut this down? Um, looking at the time, we have to shut this down because we only gave it uh, now 30 minutes, which is good. Uh, okay. But you, you, I think there were questions that were concerning um, uh, the Y Combinator. So 
Precious has left his contact details, uh, so his email and uh, also the website you can catch, you can find him on those platforms. Uh, yes, so you can also, like Marit has mentioned, you can also tweet, you can also tweet us or you can uh, email us for any question and then we'll be able to respond to that. But thank you oh. so much for attending the session and Elijah, thank you so much as well for, for, for moderating this. This was quite Somebody good. Wants, good. Yeah, um, somebody wants a number. Uh, I'm in the Bongo Hive WhatsApp group. I please uh, reach out to George. I'm sending my number here in, in the chat. Okay. But yeah, if you want to reach out to me, if you want to talk more, if you want to do more of these things, I'm sure. always I'm always down. I'm all about community. All right. um, but listen for sure. This was great. Okay. So yeah, so to close it off, we will have we'll continue having the sessions and uh, looking at this being the first format of Ask Me Anything, it was quite interactive. Uh, I won't, I will surprise you with our next guest. So we will uh, keep it, keep it as a surprise, surprise for now, but yeah, very, very interesting uh, business that we're going to host next, next month for another series of Ask Me Anything. But we do have a set of uh, 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 workshops also coming in or maybe sessions that are coming in. So just look out on our website. Uh, if you're not uh, on our Bongo Hive newsletter, I uh, can find it on the website as well. That's bonghive.co.zm. Uh, you can find us on Facebook, you can find us on Twitter. If you want, uh, you can also always subscribe to it. That's where we have all the information for you, uh, especially on Mondays. Mondays, that's when the newsletter comes out. You can follow us on Twitter for updates. Uh, we'll be able to update you with, um, with, with what's currently happening. Uh, so if you're also interested to find out about Bongo Hive as well, you can also visit our website. So thank you so much for attending. Elijah, thank you so much. And Perseus, uh, I'll send the recording to him. But yeah, this was quite a great session. And, uh, um, and also just the fact that he really opened up, uh, was really as open as possible to give us that information. So that was really great to kind of that, having that inspiration. So to close it off, um, thank you all. And we'll see you for the next, uh, next, next sessions to come. See you. <laughs> Cheers. All right.